So um, this is after the confetti you've launched. Now what? Um, I'm Amy Scavarda, Acquia, and this is Drupal Camp Atlanta. And this is potentially being recorded, so we'll see how that goes. Um, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Amy. I will be your rancher today. Um, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon. I have been a project manager in Drupal for the last three years. Oh, hold on. Might be longer now, it's tough to say. Um, I started as a development project manager, working with clients, working day to day with shops. Um, I was at Open Sorcery, and then I was independent. So working with a whole bunch of different clients, working with a whole bunch of different developers, and really getting a sense of how exactly all of this fits together as a whole development process. Um, and then in April, I went and joined Acquia as a project manager in support. So. Um, now that I've established myself as an unreliable narrator between the two sides, um, a lot of what I have to say comes from the development side, and then I'm slowly going to drop in how to build in support into your projects, how this looks overall, and um, some big pain points here. So, um, any questions, comments, harassment? Fantastic. Go. Okay. So here's what it is that we're, we're doing today. I'm basically looking at, like, you know, Confetix project winning, all of that, um, going through a project life cycle all the way through, talking about the pain points that show up in each individual area, as well as, you know, uh, lots of things. Code rot is going to come up in here a little bit, so there's at least some small hints for developers to be able to pay attention to. Um, we'll talk about why I care about this, and then I'd like to do some more structured brainstorming stuff. My talk is mostly high level, and I'm depending on you guys to be able to give, like, you know, things that you want to have solved, little details coming up here and there, and we'll work through them together. Um, I deeply detest the presentations that are talking heads all the time, and I'd like to be able to have conversations, because it's the only time you get to listen. So, um, the other thing that I'm expecting is that most of you are going to be on the more project manager-ish sides, and that you're decently familiar with Drupal. Um, if there's some other things that you want me to cover, I'm perfectly happy to go jump around and, and deal with this. I, I have no problems with, you know, winging it in that way. So, all right. There comes a time in every project when there's great rejoicing. You've gotten all the way through your scope changes. You've gotten through just even getting the deal in the door and making sure that something's going to fit you, your team, your projects, um, as well as the resources that you have on deck. Um, you've gotten through scope changes where people come by and so, you know, about halfway through on this particular feature. Um, hey, we want to be able to add three other things that are going to change the entire nature and scope of the project, but we don't really want to do anything with the budget. That's just not where we're at with that. Um, so you've also gotten through budget cuts, which happen on a fairly regular basis. You know, you come towards the end of the fiscal year and they realize they don't actually have the money that they thought, or you have burned through hours too quickly dealing with all of these various scope changes. Um, other things that happen in projects are stakeholders will change halfway through. You will start off with one particular project lead on the client side. They will leave halfway through because they've decided that they have something better to do or, you know, some other sort of resource change happens and you end up starting from the very beginning on where you were of here's why we're doing this, here's what we're doing, what changes. Um, all of these things impact your projects. They, uh, pixel perfect design requirements are when the, the uh, the project manager ends up with a PSD from a designer that doesn't know Drupal and doesn't know web and doesn't know interactions, and that becomes your spec. And that's what you get to build to. Um, on the other side is no requirements whatsoever for your project, like, well, we'd like to have a different look and feel on our website. And, um, we just, we heard about this great Drupal thing and we want it. And there's no reason for it, and then halfway through, they come up with lots of different requirements. Um, you can change developers, you can lose a developer, your developer resources go south. Um, also being able to answer the question of, when can we add more features in here? When does all of this come all together? Um, the other stuff that comes up in Drupal projects are theming challenges, where again, you've got those pixel perfect designs, <coughs> and you don't really know how exactly all of this is going to come together at the very end, and neither does the client, but they sure want it. Um, another problems that come up in terms of like projects are um, content staging challenges. You've trained your clients in some way um, to be able to put content into the website, and they come up with, I don't like the WYSIWYG, and I don't know where things are, and there's no possible way that I can get all of this content in in time. Um, other stuff on the, the end is like adding e-commerce at the last minute. Um, needing an SSL certificate like two minutes before launch. 
Um, trying to figure out where your hosting actually is, because it's not a question that you usually ask up front, is where will this project be hosted? I mean, when you first start out, you don't ask that question, and then it bites you several times, and then you remember to ask at the beginning of the project. So we've talked about where this thing is going to live once we turn it live. Um, and at the same time, we're, you're actually going to go through and check all of these things, right? So you've made it through. You've gotten through all of those laundry list of things, which is sort of a rough collection of uh, painful points that I have collected during my time. And it's done. Everything's fantastic. This is the only confetti you're going to see, Doug. I'm sorry. Um, but well, come on. I bring the confetti. Come on. It's just me up here. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, uh, Venice. Yeah. Kind of So yeah, you've done. We've gotten through that. Your confetti is here, and then the project, they keep calling you. They keep calling you with small things. It's like, well, change this thing on the homepage, or change this thing in, like, you know, there's this block on a page on the side. Can you help put, like, you know, a face in there? And we can't figure out how to put an image in. We don't know what our input formats are. And you keep picking up the phone, and every time that you see an email from these people, you feel a little bit of sense of dread. You took such good care of them when they were actually on deck with you and as a real project. Um, you know, everyone had the best time. From there, after you launched, the expectations were potentially supposed to be a little different in terms of you launched, you've had a great time, you're going to leave me alone now. And the, the expectations for the client didn't actually change. You've been available and you will continue to be available. And the place where this game ends is when the budget's come together and you finally send out the invoices and they realize that you've been billing developer time for the amount of like little niggly things that have been coming through. This is commonly what happens when the life cycle isn't of, of a project isn't taken into account and the point after like launch that maintenance window becomes the de facto phase two. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Show of hands, has this happened to anyone in here before? Yeah. This is how you get out of that phase two feeling where, here, this. Um, all of these slides are going to be up online. Um, this is going to, we're going to go through all of it, so nobody, you don't have to take notes now, it's fine. Um, overall, I had arrows in here before, they didn't make any sense, so we'll just walk through it. Generally, you start up with discovery, you go through information architecture, this is the planning stage. You go through design, development, content staging, which is also points of where um, training occurs in content staging because they now have a real reason to learn it. Quality assurance sometimes falls in around the same time. Um, for launch, I consider the time when you actually change the DNS to be your launch date, and that's where you move into maintenance. This isn't always the case, but for sake of argument, this is just where those lines are. So, again, you walk into discovery. This is the very beginning of your cycle. This answers your questions. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? A sneaky one. What happens if we do nothing? <laughs> what happens if we don't do anything? Do you actually need this, or is this a want? If you do need this, how does this actually go through? I have a different talk that I give on discovery and requirements gathering and that, so we can skip over a lot of this, but you do want to be able to do discovery at any beginning of a project. Even if it, it looks like it's kind of sneaking through into the maintenance period, once you start asking questions, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What happens if we do nothing? That tells you whether or not you're in discovery. If it's just like, what are we doing? Well, we're just fixing a couple bugs here versus I'm adding some big features that are going to impact both your particular business case for the site, your user's experience, your content administrator's experience, and just, I don't know, whoever else is gonna be involved. Um, your stakeholders' budgets, basically. If, if any of those are being impacted, you should really be looking at discovery. You should be looking at gathering your requirements for what kind of traffic are you going to be expecting for this? What's the business case behind it? Are you trying to you know, create more traffic? Are you trying to deal with the traffic that you have? Are you, are you solving a problem? Are you creating a problem at the same time? Um, and sometimes, like, if everything is running completely according to plan, you will already have signed a contract and you will be building against hours like a good consulting shop does instead of doing free work, potentially. Um, anyone want any more on this particular phase of the cycle? No, okay. 
I'm looping together information architecture into a planning sort of milestone. Because you're planning for your implementation, you're planning your schemas, you're planning if there's any migrations that need to happen, you're laying out the entire game of your project of how this is going to go down. You're planning your timeline, you're working with all these milestones in here, and the sneaky part is if you're really good, you'll be able to build in demonstration milestones and training at the end of every piece of this place. Um, so in order to be able to support this later on, you're writing down your, you know, here's why we did this. Here were the questions that we were asking at the time. Here was the conversation that was going on around us at the time. Like politically, here's what was going on for my particular client at the time. Here's why they were pushing so hard for this. Because you'll forget later and you'll come back and look at the code and be like, it was really bad. That was really bad. Why did we do this? And if you don't have your own documentation and your own narrative to be able to carry you through, you'll forget it. Um, yeah? Um, during that section right there, as far as putting in the demonstration milestones, you're not talking about doing those demonstrations while you're building product or do you? Like There's one. There's one in here that's really particularly important. Um, content staging is really your first demonstration milestone. You're for, for the overall client. But internally, you want to be able to build in milestones where you're all sitting down and like queuing, queuing it yourselves, where you've all got your heads in the game on what this particular project is so that your developer can look at the design at the same time and go, yes, we can do this. That's like internal sign-off and external sign-off is sort of where I'm going with that. Um, if, you, if you feel yourself missing on like these particular milestones, the, uh, the better way to think about it is build in like three days or so where everyone gets a chance to just breathe, look at what's ever been done. Uh, on big projects, three days is about like, you know, a good internal review time. And then from there, being able to send things to the client where the project manager says, okay, we've had a meeting, we've looked through this, we've had the conversation, we feel that we're on track at this particular point to finish by X. So that keeps everybody accountable across deck. Um, but Again, it's hard to be able to build in the time when your, your timelines are just running up and chewing on you. Does that make sense? Any more on that? Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, feel free to stop me at any point in time with that one. Um, and what this also does is this sort of cross-trains your team in understanding what everyone is doing because it's really easy to get into a silo of, well, um, the themer only works on this particular part and doesn't have any understanding of what needs to be happening over on the back end development to be able to have, um, you know, the migration work from the previous stuff. So being able to just have short conversations that are more, they're more focused than a scrum because a scrum is what am I doing today? Uh, what did I do yesterday? What am I going to, like, what's holding me up? and where am I going with this? That's sort of like short time box stuff. This is more of a conversation of how is my stuff fitting into this entire project? And if you didn't at least think about this in the information architecture step, it will totally come up and bite you later on. Um, but again, the support side for this is just making sure that you're writing it down and documenting it in a way, like even just like five bullet points. So, um, and this is planning the needs versus planning the wants of the project. Because the project will want all sorts of things, but in order to launch, you need to have certain things. So. From here, I tend to put design first because it's something that the client can touch, it's something the client is particularly interested in, and it's something that they will have a lot to say about. Um, it's an emotional language, it's, it's a time where you need to be able to get effective sign-off in a way that will come down later and actually you'll be able to go back later and say, look, we did have sign-off on this. I know that we want to change this later, but this is what this needed to be. And really setting the expectation management that you're going to be the one that's going to hold those reins together when it gets later on. When you don't have much time, we wanted to make sure that we were launching. And I know that you want to have a white site instead of a black site, but we talked about the black site earlier. Um, this totally happened. Um, so I think sometimes this, always, this will come in at the same time as information architecture. Not always, again, challenging to document, but useful. Documenting what decision was made when. So that, again, when you're supporting things, you understand why we did it this way. Um, 
development is where I talk, like I tend to roll together the fact that you're changing your theme together, you're implementing all your site code, um, you're putting whatever custom code that you need in there, and this is the time where the client tends to get the most antsy, and they really want to have that, you know, what are you doing, tell me what you're doing, like what's going on here, and that's where if you've gotten your requirements down before, you have your list of features that are happening, and you can send a checklist back to the client that's so like, look, we're building this, we're setting up this together. Also that I didn't put on this slide, we're making sure that the hosting that we've provisioned, or somehow is being provisioned, will match with what we're doing. Um, and from a technical level, this is making sure that your PHP um, versions match, making sure that everything like runs across, even though it seems really silly, but the next time that you have this happen, it's sort of like, oh man, I really wish that I had paid attention to what was actually in the stack and what we were developing on. Just something that a project manager can do, should do, and will help support much better. Um, I don't know. I think this is probably the, the space where we all live a lot in development. So, um, anything else in here? Anything I'm missing? Yeah. This is where I talk about that like initial milestone for how to be able to set the expectations. Once the con like the client comes in, this is their first time they've been able to see this. It's also turned into unofficial usability testing for. Um, this particular feature didn't work exactly like I planned it to. Also, how do I put a photo into my posts? And like, should I be dragging and dropping it around? And like, I dragged it and dropped it onto the screen. It didn't do anything. This is terrible. Well, it wasn't built like that. And we didn't talk about this the first time through. So what do I do with it now? Going through and documenting what's been changed when, so that you can, again, see where, where it was that your initial um, requirements failed, where you didn't catch it the first time, so you can catch it again the next time. Um, and for support, content staging is just sort of like, I let them in and they broke it. Okay, well, I expected this, but. Um, QA happens after potentially content staging has come through. It's everything matches the requirements that I had, everything works as designed, and shouldn't we add this one little special thing in there? Um, another thing that I try to do in this particular area so that like matches up for support is load testing. Um, potentially my site is decently as good as it's going to be. I have all the content in there. I want to make sure that it's not going to topple over when someone decides that they get off a plane and they're going to run a whole bunch of ads in the Daily Show in three days and, hey, we didn't really think about this in our hosting at all. Um, you know, like, we're supposed to have 10 million eyeballs on this site. You couldn't tell me that until now. Got it. Okay. Um, at that point, you've hit launch. You're kind of finalized, your QA is completed. The DNS cutover is where I call launch, even though many other things have happened from there. Your site is live. Um, you're potentially not going to chew on things in terms of moving things from staging into production again. You've, you're there. Everyone gets to breathe a sigh of relief. Um, until, you know, calls at midnight about like, my site is white, why is it white? Well, we didn't load test. Um, because you pushed too hard on this and you wouldn't actually take my no as an effective no. This is where all of that comes together. And then you've rolled into maintenance. Being able to have the conversation of, all right, here's our whole life cycle. Here's what we've just done for you and with you. And this is what you've paid for. This is what happens in maintenance. The expectations are that I'm going to be doing incremental fixes and training if I'm a developer that's maintaining the site for you before we get into launch because you've told me that, oh, I know this site is small, but there's going to be so much future work back there. Like, it's going to be great. I know that you don't want to do like, you know, the $10,000 site because I can give you $800,000 worth of work. Well, this is where you get to kind of ratchet back down and go, all right, I understand there is future work in this, but here's what we do now. We do incremental fix and training. We can, you know, add additional modules that are already written in here. Yes, we can add five star onto this particular page, but let's have the conversation about why we'd want to. Oh, look, we're coming into discovery again. You can add additional views and blocks for small things, but again, once you start answering the questions of what am I doing, why am I doing this, and what happens if we do nothing, you're getting into discovery. They don't like to hear this, they really don't, but in order to be able to keep your sanity and your own development time, you're going to have to be able to put that expectation of, here's what I said that I would do for you. Whether this comes through in a contract, or this comes through in just like a, um, 
a simple checklist of congratulations, we've launched, here's what we do now. Just really setting down those expectations in writing at least once or twice to be able to make sure that everyone's hearing this is what support looks like. Um, again, it's not phase two of your project at all. So the reason I went for the tree is because you've built this fantastic tree, but the root structure is what you're supporting now. If you've been in the business for a while, you probably have a lot of clients that are coming back periodically and they want other work, or they want to be able to have the conversation with you, oh, I just need five minutes or something to be able to look at this particular block and figure out what this is. What's starting to happen now is people are being able to do effective handoff. Again, I work for Aqua Support, so I'm looking at this from both sides. Being able to manage that handoff into something else where the expectation changes of, if the developer built the site, it somehow becomes your responsibility to fix it right then and the baton death march starts again like you were getting into towards the end of launch. But if a support team handles it, well, my gosh, you guys are great. Like, we came to you with a problem and you solved it, but like we, it wasn't your fault in the first place, but you helped fix it. That's the difference in expectation management between being development and being just straight support. So, you know, code rot is also the other way that this goes. Um, if you are not paying attention to, all right, show of hands. The Wednesday security advisory lottery that comes out from Drupal.org. How many people get those? Okay. How many people pay attention to the site that's actually listed, you know, the, the module that's listed in there? Actually, do themes ever get... They can, but it doesn't Yeah, I haven't seen the theme come by in a really long time. So, all right, just modules. How many people look for the module that's, you know, that's won the security lottery advisory? Yeah. Then, how many people actually go back and look and see where this was used on your previous sites and go update it? Half, 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 half a person? Half a person does this. This is why sites get hacked, is because the code rot that occurs is... How, yeah, isn't this true? I would say I will, but someone else has to do it. Yeah, somebody else has to do it. That's the thing. It's like someone else needs to be paying attention to the security advisories or even just like the updates that have come out. Like, you know, um, this wasn't like a really big deal, but we've added some new functionality for this particular module. If you've done your documentation and you've kept it in a way that makes sense, you can actually easily go through and like just search through, okay, this site had this, this site had this one. Let's go back, you know, send a proactive email to the client, say, hey, we're going to be doing some work here. The only people that are able to do this are the people that are really focused on, like, this is all we do. Um, so this is why a developer would care about support. I also thought the slide was kind of funny. So that's all. Any more than I need to say about that particular, I mean, it's fairly clear this is how sites get hacked. <laughs> so I care about support because I think that this is one of the places where the Drupal community falls down the most in terms of building fantastic sites and then we don't really take care of them very well. Um, we take care of them when they come back and they want to be able to upgrade and give us more money, but they don't really do a fantastic job of, again, staying proactive on the security advisory. It's just not really what we're here for yet. And I'd like to be able to instill more of a culture of taking care of the things that just fed you. Um, again, we do really well on being able to clearly define what it is that we're doing being able to communicate to a client, really being able to show value for, I mean, free open source, what could possibly go wrong? And then we launch things, and we may have done a fantastic job on user experience, and it may be perfect, but if you can't continually hear what your clients are doing at the same time as building more stuff, the whole game isn't gonna work. So that's why I care about this, and it's why I'm coming out and actually playing ball. Um, so at this point, I can talk about a number of different things. We can talk about how this is working from the Acquia side and how the handoff works and all of that. Um, but it, it's not a salesy presentation. It's just sort of like, this is how it's working in one particular place. I can also talk about what it would take to build your own support team or other resources that are out there. Yes? What kind of projects are you completing and handing off? Um, so what happens, at least from, from my side, is someone's launching a site and they're bringing it to me. 
So I come in about like, oh, potentially like, if I'm really good, I'll come in about three weeks before launch if everything is like matched up. And I'm the one that basically helps walk them on to either through launch and then getting into support and what's available in support and how we work. So I'm the one that effectively like manages the handoff, sort of. Um, but that doesn't really answer your question. Your question is more about like what projects am I seeing come through? No, I mean, well, I mean, because the way you phrased it was, it was obviously a launching project. So I was curious what kind of projects you're launching. Oh no, I mean more about like people, clients that are launching projects, and then they're they've bought a support contract and they're coming in to us, and we get to feed and water them until such time as they decide to go into another phase of development. Okay. So now you doing internal development on your own properties, comments, etc. Not to speak of. If, if you gave me another, like, you know, uh, 12 hours in the day, yes, I'd love to. Um, no, I'm swamped right now, and I don't really have the capacity to be able to do other things. I'm working on it, you know. Um, and I think the only way that you can actually do that is by building better processes so that you're spending less time dealing with, like, the one-offs um, and being able to, like, okay, I have a process that catches everyone as they come through. Um, I, yeah, if you have any better ways to build capacity, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> So, um, I have more on what it would take to build your own support team. So, I think the way that this could work is people being able to dedicate resources, like the training programs that we're talking about are a really good resource to be able to build, like the people who don't quite have what it's going to take to be like a really good developer yet. I mean, yeah, okay, they know what Drupal is, they know how to spell it, they can come in and use like the admin menus and that sort of thing. Um, but you don't really want to turn them loose with some really challenging migration stuff. So dedicating resources like through that, hey, you just got out of a training program, fantastic. Let's hire you on as like, you know, a junior engineer position that's training in and training through maintenance and support. Um, you're also gonna need to have a dedicated schedule for this, like time spent on certain clients and that sort of thing and being able to track that, knowing where all of this is running in your own ways. Um, this only really works really well on retainer clients where you're billing against hours or you've negotiated a, a, a lower rate for what maintenance and support looks like. Um, and everyone's okay with this and no one's surprised. Um, the other challenge is being able to project manage maintenance. <laughs> it, 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 it's impossible. Um, you can have a good guess. When I was at, um, you know, working as a development PM, I, I'd have a list of clients that we had, and I could roughly sort of look at it and be like, you, this one right here down like the list. I haven't heard from you in three weeks, and I'm pretty sure that this is the week you're going to come by and mess everything up. But that's really just more like dead reckoning project management. I have no idea of who's going to have a problem this week, but I'm thinking it's you. Sometimes I was wrong, more often I was right. Um, but how do you actually put that on your schedule? You just build time in for something is going to blow up this week. I don't know what it is. I'm sure I'll find out. This also doesn't mean that this is agile without budgets. Agile is like working quickly, not really knowing what the end product is going to be, but making sure that you're listening to the client and going from there. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an effective way to manage maintenance because you don't really want to go anywhere without having an end goal in mind and this is you know this is sort of a cautionary note um, and again that effective handoff between development and support is the the challenging part because the expectations are different the expectation as developers absolutely I will fix this for you support is I'm taking a look we're gonna see what we can do with this there may be some other things that are impacting this that I'm not totally aware of so everyone hold the phone don't let yourselves on fire um, yeah, I mean, what else do you want to go into from here? Because this is, I've, I've basically set up, yeah. Yes. It is a little punishing, yeah, yeah. Um, what I would probably do 
<laughs> and this is just how I think about this, is I would schedule developer movie time, where you have all of like the, the sites that need to be updated that week, you go find a great movie on Netflix, and you sit there and you push everything in, and by the time that the movie is over, that's your update time should be done. <laughs> this is just how I think it's like, I think this should be more fun than just sitting there and slogging through like the, and then I had to patch it and I had to make sure. The other thing that will help you with that is being able to put a process in place with your clients where like, okay, you have a staging in a production environment. I will push this patch to staging. You and I will work to make sure that everything works like, you know, it didn't eat your blocks like 6.22 did. Um, you know, making sure that everything reacts as it should, then from there we'll push to pre production. So like it's a proactive sort of thing. And the most challenging part is actually making sure that all the communication lines up, not the technical, like, you know, bits, bytes there. And, um, so I think, yeah, scheduling like just a, a short window of time where you're also doing something perhaps more fun than, you know, cleaning up after yourself. Yeah. Well, in her case, charge for that hourly, or do you, you know, say, oh, hey, you know, we're going to be great and we're just going to do this forever and ever and ever. Um, so yes, you should be charging for that, however, if you can build that into like the retainer thing about like, okay, after we've launched, you'll keep us on for like, you know, 200 a month or something, um, and we'll give you like two hours of maintenance and development time, or maintenance time, just don't say development, like yes. stop that, get that word out of there. Um, I think. Because long term, you want to be able to have that time be scheduled, and so the, where this falls down is where you're constantly getting pulled into little fire drills and things, and you can't actually really focus on the work that you've brought in. As a consultant, you need to be able to constantly keep moving forward. Um, and eventually, you might get tired of like doing work without getting paid. Crazy thing. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that's how I would schedule that, and I may actually have to do a blog post on developer movie time for yeah how that works. Love that yeah, that was fantastic. Sorry. <laughs> um, anything else in here about like what it would look like to build your own support inside? Other questions or just like projects that are coming back and need help with? I don't know. This is why you have a staging environment, exhibit A. Exhibit B is making sure that you're proactive with the client on the other end because, if, again, anything of reasonable size, potentially you will not be turning these things loose off to someone that can't actually watch over them at the same time. You're just a acting as the Drupal expert here. It's like, you should be doing this upgrade thing. This upgrade thing is important. If it gets into a place where it, yeah, it becomes a big regression, a big mess like that, that's where you're coming into discovery mode where you're like, why did this break? What do we need to do now? Um, what else is impacting this? Is that a fair enough? Yeah, I mean, I guess I wondered, like, do, do you guys, when you do, you know, to whatever extent you do this, do you, um, do you have, like, regression testing plans in place? You no, know, it's just kind of, like, if it breaks, then you deal with it. Yeah, I mean, that's the... I would love to be able to say, yes, yes, regression testing. I totally do that all the time. But it's more of a conversation of everything is totally different. Um, like, you don't really have a good guess on what exactly is going to go wrong next, really. Um, I wish I had a different answer. Yes? So we, we've actually had this problem before, it turns out, um, where like, you know, the feeds API changed underneath us and the functionality was different. So the way that this worked out was, okay, 
we're trusting the community here. They're making the right decisions for overall like functionality. At the same time, if whatever you needed in that particular module was so important that someone else needed too, chances are it's going to be like you're going to be able to find it. So the way that you interact with this for the client is. Again, we've got a really big community. That we do a lot of really interesting things. We have a lot of resources throughout that community that are working on a lot of different competing visions. Just how this goes. We'll do what we can to make sure that you're getting the best solution possible out of what's available. If not, we can have another conversation about like building more custom code from there. But you start up with like, look, we have all these great things. We have great things, and look, they'll probably fit in your box. And chances are, you'll probably find the solution that will take you 90% of the way there, and like that last 10%, you can figure out, well, what happens here? What's next? This is a horribly cynical question. <laughs> okay. I think you get it because someone's done the work. Honestly, I mean, like you can you can do whatever you want to with that. But from my perspective, somebody's already done the work, um, and you might as well benefit from it from the sheer fact that it's there. That's pretty much it. I mean, uh, the, I guess the more challenging part on that one is like, yeah, you may get more benefits from that, but what exactly was it that you really needed in there? Um, I think sometimes that particular area might open up more headaches because then you have to train them on this new thing. So. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we basically wanted into the brainstorming session, so you know, this is kind of what I was looking for. And at this point in time, oh, yes, it's at three forty. Uh, so. I know this is a uh, session for later on. The CEO, how do you guys handle? Do you guys do anything as regards to that? Um. Is that coming in, in the process of uh, dealing with you know the brainstorming and getting all that content? That should be. That's content staging. That's really more the content staging. I try to deal less with the whole like you know. Um, I, I really think of Drupal is more of like a great wrapper for the content that they should potentially already have, um, and like I'm all kinds of not an expert in being able to talk about SEO and that sort of thing, which is why we have great tools and great other people um, that are happy to be able to come and have that conversation with them. Um, at, sometimes, sometimes the clients don't always have all the content. They, they oh yeah. Yeah, at that point in time, I actually send them towards like you know whatever SEO checklist that I can find that would be most appropriate for them, and something like as well as making introductions to other people that will do SEO. Um, just you know the conversation about look, I don't do this, but I think you're going to need this based on what your site goals were. Um, if your site goals involve traffic, we should talk to somebody that understands SEO. That person isn't going to be me. That's usually how I handle that, but I I can't remember the last time that happened to me. So, um, I don't know. Um, any further questions that I'm missing? Ken, you were wandering off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, again, support is always funny. You just may not always be available for how funny it is. Um, which is a nice way of saying sometimes it's really hard. Um, and being able to have that rotation through is like, I would love to be able to see all of that happen. No, absolutely. Um, you don't find very many professional support people that are there for a very long time. Um, uh, it's sometimes it's also like you know you're a Drupal developer in your own right, and you enjoy being able to answer other people's like crazy wacky questions because that's always what happens. Um, but I would love to see more of like the support. I don't know. I'd love to see it get more love in the community as something that's actually important and keeps the whole like the wheels on the bus. Um, but I think there are lots of things that keep the wheels on the bus. We just happen to need this particular one right now. So um, thank you. I'm here all week. Yeah.